Everyone, Let's see if this works. And welcome uh, to the Society of Leftover Biologists Super Spreader Event of 2024. Um, this is a study, kind of an underappreciated system uh, in respect with respect to floral nectar, the uh, and the ethanol concentrations within them. They're uh, widespread uh, across many different species, as I'll show. But let's get into some of the context here. Uh, so this is a mutualistic path diagram. You got your pollination services providing angiosperms in exchange for calories. Uh, fermentative yeasts uh, exchanging calories for antimicrobial defense against spoilage bacteri uh, bacteria, mainly. There's a lot of research out of uh, Tadash Kami's lab, Stanford, formerly. Uh, uh, and then my advisor, I'm a PhD student in Robert Dudley's lab, and you wrote a book in 2014 called The Drunken Monkey, which kind of does the same, introduces this idea of ethanol mediated uh, signal of uh, caloric value, an honest signal, unlike, you know, the corpse flower or something. This one actually reflects it obligatorily the presence of sugars. And it relates to the drunken monkey in that this applies to humans and forgivery as well, so there's this interconnection between fruit eating and nectar eating in this uh, in context of this study. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this uh, co-evolutionary hypothesis that has some evidence for between angiosperms and yeast, and get some of the timing that, uh, so here's a phylogeny of 36,000 angiosperm species, and uh, this line here is around 125 million years ago, right? So we're kind of ballparking when angiosperms began to radiate, and, uh, when the earliest fruits and nectar appeared is um, kind of tenuous, but I'll, I can also speak on that. Uh, but the yeast is an interesting thing here. Between 150 and 100 million years ago, um, they have the development of something called crabtree positive yeast, which can break down sugar into ethanol, biomass, and CO2, even in the presence of oxygen, which means they're getting one 20th the ATP they would from the regular metabolism, as far as this may accumulate consumed strategy. And that's just to say that some yeasts um, had, had this very intense evolutionary period between 100 and 100 million years ago with respect to sugar metabolism, specific fermentation. Uh, this likely evolved in fruits, but um, we know so that gymnosperms have uh, something called pollen droplets that are analogous to nectar, um, and they also have some fleshy, sugary fruits that are the exception to the typical gymnosperm angiosperm rule. So um, this probably no may have evolved with gymnosperms. Um, and there are many previous studies that will just kind of put a blurb in about ethanol at playing some important role or other, but nobody's actually ever measured ethanol content of flower nectar before this, except this one study that did it on this Fluorescence in Madagascar with a tree shrew, no Madagascar, Malaysian. Apologies, uh, there's a close up, it's just overflowing, it's zoophily, mammalian pollinator syndrome. And this thing's got like a ton of ethanol, right? Chronic intake of fermented fluorinex of ethanol tree shrews. And they did a uh, microbial uh, char characterization as well, and there's a lot of fermentative yeasts, including Saccharomyces cerevisiae, brewer's yeast in there. Um, well, this is counting down, right? Alright, so uh, to measure ethanol concentrations, I, uh, me and my collaborator, Amin, uh, from the New Zealand, Berkeley went to this uh, Mediterranean climate, Tan Garden of Berkeley, or it's Mediterranean climate. This is the South Africa section here. Um, and here's, we got some capillary tubes and just kind of get in there's Melianthus, a South African um, plant pollinated by sunbirds. And you can see the, it's going to freeze here, there's nectar here. You know, there's a, here's a uh, bird pollinated flower called Puya. It's just oozing out of the flowers. Uh, you know, birds are supposed to land on it and kind of get in there. And you can see the kind of, well, that's just kind of neat. I didn't know you could even do this until I went out and actually tried. Uh, yeah. Method. So, you know, we're going to use this uh, bioassay systems. Uh, or in Hayward, they're like a drive down down the way, and they develop this assay kit for ethanol that's enzyme based, a synthetic enzyme that produces NAD. Uh, so it's very accurate, and it's very uh, using nectar and some PCR tubes, and 
make a sugar ethanol ca calibration and serial dilution, and you can see the dark circles here where the high concentrations of calibration ethanol standard. Drug. And also, you have measured bricks, which is like a sugar a proxy for sugar. It's pretty standard in um, measurements of nectar. And uh, so one of the things early on that happened was like, the very first time we went out to measure flowers, it was on a 9.9 degrees Celsius day. It's a really cold day for Tampa. It's a cold spring day. A week later, it was 30 degrees Celsius. I managed to sample these two species on both days, and lo and behold, the ethanol concentration from cold to hot for both are significant. When you combine them together into one plot, it's even more significant. It's, uh, so this just shows you that it's working. But look at these concentrations, they're so tiny. 0 0.04, 0 0.02, I mean, we're talking about tiny, tiny minuscule concentrations of ethanol. I'll, I'll get there. And here's a phylogeny of the 42 species we sampled. Again, all in the same botanical garden except for a couple here that are local, um, you know, California species. And then I did a literature review and characterized the dominant uh, pollinator for each species. And just to show you, there's some variety. We we're interested in looking at hummingbirds and sunbirds in particular, but also insects come out. Uh, a lot of plants turns out are insect pollinator syndrome. And then the dot, dot, dot here is like chiropterophily, zoophily, and ornithophily. Uh, so here's some results, right? The overall average is 0.012%, so even lower than you were looking at before, this dotted line. And here's uh, insect pollinated, sunbirds, other, and then the hummingbirds. And you can see there's pretty fair distribution. A lot of them have very little, uh, less than, you know, average, and some of them have more. Uh, no surprise. And then uh, this didn't show up here, but um, with this included, it's 0 0.023. You know, insects have significantly higher average, mostly because of this local um, Fremontodendron. California plant bush, uh, but if you remove this one, it goes down the same as the others, and so that's kind of that's kind of remarkable, right? It's not a pattern. So there's some other something else driving the whole thing that we're measuring here. Um, so then a PGLMM uh, to sort of control for some of these random effects and measured, um, and so the saccharides came out weekly, weekly significant. Pollinator syndrome, of course, the insect pollinated one, came out on top. And if you remove it, it's still on top, but then hummingbirds are also significant. And, um, and that controls the, the top random effect out of these was ambient temperature, and that's clear from the first slide of the results I showed you. And then these species specific non phylogenetic effects, which also makes sense because it seems some species are more into have something else going on, microbial units. Okay, so now to the part you've been waiting for, what is the significance of these tiny, tiny concentrations of ethanol? Who cares? And it may be that that isn't the case, but um, hummingbirds, as an example, consume 100% of their body mass in nectar daily, which is an underappreciated fact. Hard working animals. Imagine drinking 70 liters of nectar to sustain yourself per day. If it had a little bit of alcohol and you drank that much, it, it, it would add up. Um, and so that's doing some back of the napkin math that I'm not going to, I have a slide that I'm not going to walk you through on this, but it's 0.7 standard drinks at the 0.012% ethanol level when you equate it to human standards. Um, and then uh, on a hot day where it's a little hotter, it equates to 2.2. So this leads to the question, well, is the hummingbird metabolism in any way, I mean, you know, there's small bodies of metabolism, it's like 15 to 20 times faster than ours. That is oxidative metabolism. Uh, but in terms of specific to alcohol, if they're, you know, if we as primates have evolved to have a more efficient metabolism regarding alcohol, and we know there's a whole evolutionary history there, but it, it's involved in our lineage. If uh, hummingbirds don't have that, as much as they're 20 times worse at metabolizing it, then their body size you know, they're still having some effect. And this could be driving, uh, you know, hummingbirds, uh, you know, uh, their distributions in terms of the fermentative uh, capability. If we don't know, you know, we just have measurements. This is the limitation of one microbial community in the hills of Berkeley, with the exception of that one really high um, flannel bush species that was in a different part of Berkeley. 
Uh, and maybe that's far enough to make microbial communities significantly different and affect this, uh, these kind of results even further. And there may be why some pollinators are attracted to some, uh, some nectar uh, flowers. Okay, and then there are uh, many other questions and systems that this would apply to. Here's some columnar cacti in Sonora and in uh, Western Mexico, and uh, there's these bats that my migratory nectar rivers bats that fly up the west coast of Mexico, and they are attracting the phenology, the flowering phenology of these uh, different species of tall cacti, the flowers at the top, as the spring continues. And so how are they finding this really uh, sort of transient source of food along the way? Maybe they're honing in on alcohol, uh, ethanol that's vaporizing, vaporizing from the flowers. And we know bats have a very, actually uh, fruit bats have like uh, one part per billion ethanol uh, olfactory threshold. Um, so that's a really neat system. I thought that, you know, it's a very cute one. Uh, imagine how long this picture took to take. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, this fun question is like, here's the, a flower with nectar freely exposed. Like, how does the structure of the flower affect um, how ethanol is retained in the parts per million concentration of the opening? Because if you're a bee and you're hovering around the opening of a flower, you want to know if there's nectar in there before taking the time to land and stick your face somewhere where they're, you know, um, I don't know, there's danger inside of danger picture you're looking in the flower, you see it being advantageous to know beforehand um, whether or not there's a signal of nectar being present in there. Um, and orchids have even fun things like nectar spurs, especially designed for this. Um, and so there's, yeah, there's a lot of uh, interesting things that you could ask. Hey, all right, how exactly on time? Yeah, some questions uh, I got for you guys, but the uh, very Museum of Urban Zoology, thank you to them for funding some of the sunbird, hummingbird research and uh, take any questions.